Yeah. So we're going to take a step back. Friday, we were talking about the civil and I, we did a timeline. Important event. I said that the civil rights movement, the modern civil rights movement, really started ramping up in the 1950s and 60s. It's about a When you learn about the civil rights movement, usually in elementary and middle school, you hear about Rosa Parks, you learn about Martin Luther King Jr., you usually read or listen to the I Have a Dream speech, and you don't talk about the second piece, which was a change that happened in the 1950s, and it wasn't overnight, it was a gradual thing, but a change happens in which there is less emphasis on peaceful demonstrations and peaceful protests, and more of a tactic that advocated the use of violence against violence. A more military out of the that kind of break, uh, the mid and late 1960s. It's associated with social groups like the Black Panthers, which advocate for armed revolution. Or no, sorry, that's not armed uh, self defense is what it would be, not revolution. Armed self defense. It advocates less about integrating society into one big happy family and more of black separatism, and we're going to talk about this stuff. So here's what I want you to write down. Civil rights movement. 1950s to the 19, early 1970s, okay? And we're going to break it into two characteristics, two periods, two groups. The first one is going to be from 1950 until 1965. The second one is going to go from 1965, and this is ish, it's not immediate, but around, to the early 1970s. Do you follow so far? If you need to come up closer, there's a lot of primetime seating going on right here. The first movement is considered a non-violent approach. It's non-violent Tactics. Can anyone raise your hand and tell me an example of nonviolent tactics that would be considered falling into this category? Yeah. Oh, sit ins. Absolutely. This is the, one of the early ones, 1960. Sit ins. Others. Zach. Yeah, and so what's Martin Luther King? Yeah, so he's modeling after, after Gandhi big time. Mahatma Gandhi significantly influenced Martin Luther King Jr., for sure. Martin Luther King Jr. is most often associated with organizing what? Yeah, marches, protests. Marches and peaceful protests. March on Washington. The Birmingham, Alabama protest. That's the one that, uh, that in which the attack dogs and the hoses were, were used and electric cattle rods were used on demonstrators. Did, did we talk about this on Friday for people who's here? If, if I get a chance, I'll show you some video of it at the end of class. Today. I think we can get through everything and I'll show you a video of it. Huh? Absolutely. Do you remember what city the, boy, the most famous bus boycotts happened in? Montgomery. Montgomery bus boycotts. That's Rosa Parks. And you could also add in things like voter registration drives, the Freedom Summer, 1964. Uh, is it 1964 65? Freedom Summer. I think it's 65. We have to take a look. Another thing that you must associate with this time period is it is focused on the South. Southern discrimination, Southern racism, helping to register black voters in the South and end Racism and discrimination there. Last thing. Yeah. Um, what do you want us to say about the SCLC? I'll, I'll tell you in a second. I'll tell you in a second. I'm actually about to get there. 
And the last part is the goal. The goal of this, while the goal of all of the civil rights is to improve conditions and rights of African Americans, one of their main overarching goals is assimilation. Assimilation and integration. They're working towards integrating African Americans and whites into a, so a peaceful society living side by side. This is very different than what we're going to see in the second shift. So the next one, which is also, by the way, sometimes called the Black Power Movement, associated with the Black Power Movement. And we really see this ramp up in the mid-1960s onward. It's a gradual shift. This movement is associated with the philosophy of using violence against violence. You meet violence with violence. It's unlike the South, although there is some of this embraced in the South, ideology embraced, embraced in the South, is primarily in Northern and Western many riots that break out in northern and western cities during the mid-1960s. For example, in Watts, it's an it's a inner city of California, so $30 million worth of damage. There's 30-odd people that die in the rioting. Thousands of buildings are burned and looted. Detroit, 1967. Ask your grandma around here, if they remember the Detroit riots in 1967, I see you shaking your head. Yeah. My dad remembers seeing National Guardsmen with, like, snipers on the top of, like, a Sears. It was, it was really bad, you guys. And, and you have been watching in the news lately, or I hope you've at least been following somewhat, things going on in Baltimore and Ferguson, Missouri. I can't even begin to tell you this, how, bigger, how much bigger the scope was of these riots that were going on across the country. There was another one in Newark. Um, in Detroit, for example, I was, I was trying to look it up to see how many people had been arrested in Baltimore and Ferguson in the protesting that went on. I think, it, best I could tell, there's about 200 to 300, somewhere in there, maybe 350 people that have been arrested in the rioting that went on in Baltimore and, and things over the last couple weeks. In Detroit, there were 7,000 people arrested during the, the riots there. 44 people lost their lives, the majority of them black. Thousands of buildings were burned and looted in the Detroit riots compared to a couple dozen in Baltimore. I mean, not to minimize what's going on, but it is hard to really, I mean, federal troops had to be sent in, like Matthias was saying. The governor at the time was Mitt Romney's dad. I don't, I don't know if you knew that. But it was Governor Romney had to not only call in the Michigan National Guard, but the, the federal troops were sent in by LBJ. It was, I remember my grandmother telling me they were coming in from out of town. They were visiting relatives. They weren't allowed to go back to their house. They lived in Detroit. They said, it's not safe. Sorry, you got to go stay with relatives. And it was bad. It was really bad. The, the Detroit riots are, from my understanding, depending on how you measure it, the third worst riots in our country's history. Third worst. I mean, it's... it's it's bad. It all starts from a police raid on um, an illegal, I don't know that much about it, but an illegal um, bar in Detroit. It was called the Blind Pig. Yeah. What are the other two riots? The worst are the Civil War riots, when, which is actually ironic. After Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation, in which he declared that slavery would be outlawed and slaves were free in, in the rebelling states, uh, people in New York City rioted because they were being drafted. They implemented a draft in New York City. They expanded the draft, and people didn't want to go fight a war that was a war about slavery, and they rioted in New York City, and hundreds of people died. It was, it was really bad. Uh, the other ones were in the 90s. Summer, my grandpa conducted a off for the 18th Volvo Bridge. 
Uh, but then the people around there called the police because they thought the riots were started. still going on. It's crazy. That's crazy. Yeah, it, 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 I believe you. I believe you 100%. The last thing that you should do, it, it should associate this with, the goal is not assimilation and integration. The goal is black separatism. It's a good question, and I'll, I'll talk about this. Black separatism and black nationalism. Write this down, and then I'll explain. And I was hoping someone would ask me about this. Nationalism. Nationalism. Um, here's the key word. The key word in Zach's question is, what's the difference between black separatism and, black, or, and segregation, is what you said, right? The key word is, is forced. Segregation is forced, and the facilities are poor, and you're forced to be segregated. Separatism would be, um, it, it, well, I suppose, but you would never want to write that in an essay. But it's, it's empowering black communities through black leadership, through self-promotion and self-advocacy, not depending on the government to change your status, um, there's another movement that makes a resurgence back to, in this time period, which is the Back to Africa movement, uh, which, which we've talked a little bit about earlier in the class. It, it very much so does not, it, it's, it's not embracing assimilation, where whites and blacks are living together. It's black communities purposely segregating themselves, but it's not the segregation that you would associate with the South after the Civil War and post-Reconstruction. It's not a forced segregation. It's a segregation by choice in which you develop your own community and your own society that can, is capable of dealing with some of the issues that are, that are focusing. You should know that this, this black power movement really comes about after there's been some significant gains for African Americans. I mean, so think about this. The, the Voting Rights Act goes into place in 1965, the Civil Rights Right, and so you might be able to, if if you were an African American student, you might be able to go into that diner that you were previously protesting with sit-ins. But is is the attitude going to change? Is the environment, is the racist discrimination going to be? Important? And so what you get, but. Mean harmony and peace in some utopian society, and they would mock the, the leaders of this movement would mock Martin Luther King Jr. mostly privately, but saying he was too much of a pacifist that to achieve a, a, a true equality for African Americans. And if you take a look, even though you have the right to vote, that doesn't address any of the income disparity between blacks and whites. It doesn't address any of the discrimination that goes on and you're just daily, day-to-day -day lives. And so there's still a lot to accomplish, even post-1965, and even still today. If you take a look at income inequality between blacks and whites, it, there's a big gap. So the last part, the last part of this is who do you associate with each? These are things, these are statements you make to talk about in an LEQ or a DBQ. Who do you then, who do you then use as examples? Well, the big one for this is who? MLK Jr. Another one. Nope, not, not for this one. Rosa Parks. I heard someone say it. Um, you could talk about Kennedy, but we're talking about leaders of, we're going to talk about African American leaders in the Civil Rights Movement. You could talk about how LBJ fits into here and Kennedy would, would fit in here as well. That's, that's actually a good one. I didn't think to put that in, but yeah. Uh, another one would be James Meredith. He would be a good example. Most students won't know this one. Meredith. He's the first student to attend which school in the South? Oh, Ole Miss. Miss. He's the first African American to attend Ole Miss. Courageous, courageous, courageous individual. Trust me. He had to have federal troops escort him class to class. He was at a place getting an education where the vast majority, the overwhelming majority of people did not want him there and were intimidating him while he was there. And I think I told you on Friday, his first class that he enrolled in was a, an American colonial history class. He would have been learning about slavery in the colonies during that time period. Uh, organizations that you should know. This would be uh, the NAACP, which was founded in early, 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 20th century America, it's like 1905 or 04 is when the NAACP is actually founded. 
This stands for the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. The National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. It's founded by the guy W.E.B. Du Bois. The guy who founds it is Du Space B O I S Du Bois Du Bois, huh? He's a civil rights activist. He 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 is well known for his writings. There's two two early civil rights advocates or Du Bois and Booker T. Washington. Do that. Does that name ring a bell? Booker T. Washington basically said the key for African Americans helping themselves out for blacks in the South is education. Give them educational opportunities. Teach them training. They will the key piece. Key piece. Uh, Du Bois was all about changing things from a political landscape, gaining the right to vote, gaining the courts. P. One of the things that they do big time, is lawsuits, filing lawsuits on behalf of African Americans. So that's the two, they're kind of, there was actually a whole DBQ once on, it was in the 1980s, but on the difference, difference in ideologies and strategies. Do I need to shut the... No, they're oh. back. Hi, friends from AP Chem. What time do we got here? 12.15, right? Hi, friends. So, is it just you? Is there other people coming? Hold on. So here's what I ask, Chris. I know that you just got out of it and you're feeling like, I just need you to come in and we need to finish these 15 minutes. If we finish the 15 minutes, you can talk all about AP Chem, but I need your focus, okay? So this is recording and we're going to have it up online for you. So, so, NAACP. The next one is the SCLC, which someone was just asking me. The Southern Christian Leadership Conference. You need to know this. The SCLC, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. This is founded by Martin Luther King Jr. It's organizing black churches in the South. African American churches in the South play an integral part in the civil rights movement. It was one of the few social institutions that were allowed to flourish post-Reconstruction United States. Churches were some of the most well-organized social organizations in the South, and getting them on board and organized, promoting the civil rights movement was, was a crucial, crucial factor. A lot of civil rights meetings were occurring in churches. A lot of those marches and protests, they're planned in churches. Does that make sense? Martin Luther King Jr. himself was the preacher of a Baptist church in the South. The last one, and I'm going to write this in a weird way. S, N, and I'm going to do the other color. C, C. SNCC. This is the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. This became a radical organization later in the 1960s. It started off as peaceful. In fact, this is the organization that planned the sit-ins. This is the organization that planned the sit-ins. However, later on it's going to be... ...peaceful organization, much more military. Now, other side. People you should know, Malcolm X. Malcolm X is which with he did collaborate but with the name. Oh, we have. Did you? Yeah, do you know where the Nation of Islam was founded? Detroit, 1930. I found that out just this weekend. I didn't realize that. Nation of Islam. The person, Stokely Carmichael. Car, M-I-C-H-A-E-L. Stokely Carmichael. He is associated with the SNCC. And what he does to make this a more violent black separatism, black nationalism promoting organization is he fires all of the white people essentially that work there. All of the leadership becomes African American leadership and he makes it very much so an organization run by blacks for blacks. Next one is Huey 
P. Newton. And he founds, along with one other person, the Black Panthers. Did we talk about the Black Panthers yet, or was that last hour that I did? I didn't tell you anything about them at all? So the Black Panthers, their actual name was the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense. They are not a political party. It's a social organization. The Black Panthers are a social organization, and they advocate armed resistance. Armed resistance and armed self-defense. And let me tell you what they did. Hang in there with me. The Black Panthers were very influential out on the West Coast. They would follow, a, they would armed Black Panther members, sometimes with semi-automatic rifles, would follow police officers to ensure that police brutality was not going on in some of these inner city neighborhoods. That sounds very radical. It is radical. But you also have to know that there was very, very, very much so a prevalence of police brutality going on in these inner city neighborhoods. And their point was having peaceful demonstrations about it wasn't going to stop the police violence, that armed protest and self-defense was the way to go. Yeah? Wouldn't that cause a problem with Lady Cascade violent confrontations between Black Panthers? There were police raids. Leaders. Uh, absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Now, this is, this is the big portion of it. There are several events that this is where we're going to tail off. There are several events that you should know that happened in 1965. So the first one is 1965, and it's the Watts riots in California. Like I said, 34 people died, 4,000 arrested, dozens and dozens of burnings, buildings are burned. 1966, the Black Panthers founded by Huey P. Newton. 1967, Detroit riots. For people that just came in, we just talked about those. Go back and take a look at them. 1968, Martin Luther King Jr. and Robert F. Kennedy, Robert Francis Kennedy, are both assassinated. 1968 was a really, really dark year. That was also the same year of the Tet Offensive, the My Lai Massacre. A lot of events happened in 1968. No, not at all. Not at all. It was not a good year. Yeah. JFK is dead. Uh, LBJ is not, has decided not to run for president that year. Do you remember when I showed you that atomic bomb political ad campaign? The girl picking days, 10, 9, and then it flashes to the atomic bomb. That was 1968. That was that election of 1968. Yeah, Katie. Um, Robert Kennedy, Secretary of Defense, No, no. So, good question. Robert Kennedy is assassinated. Yes, he's running for president, and he's assassinated in, I think, June or July of 1968. His personal assistant was beat unconscious during the freedom, during the freedom rides. Uh, what else happens? There's one more thing. Oh, this is a big one that we haven't talked at all about, and there might be, there could be a short answer involving Native American stuff. There's something called the AIM movement that begins. 1968. And this stands for the American Indian Movement. It is essentially the Native American civil rights movement of their, of their time. and better treatment. If we were following Native American, we'd really trace back to the 1830s or 1820s and go in the trail of the person the and talk about the Dawes Act, remember 1887 with the Dawes 
impact and forced assimilation. And then supported reform in Native American policy to start treating them better. It's FDR. It's called the Indian or Native American New Deal, the Indian New Deal. It's part of the New Deal. And then immediately, during Eisenhower's years, they go right back to that forced assimilation policy. So we've changed again for the negative. And then in the 1970s, you get this movement called AIM, which advocates for improved, improved conditions for Native Americans and increased government spending and funding on, on aid programs and awareness about Native Americans and, and, their, and their plight. Yeah? So that's, that's, that's too tough of a question. So the question is, like, when are the last Native Americans still living on reservations in the tribal, you're saying, like, in customary ways? It depends on who you're talking about where you're talking about. There are still Native Americans that embrace cultural um, traditions that date back into the 16 and 1700s. But most Native Americans that still live on res reservations are living in homes that would look like homes you would see in subdivisions today, although many of them are very, very poor. There is a, there is a, um, a TED Talk. Do you guys remember watching the TED Talk at the very beginning of the year on the danger of a single story? Uh, there's a TED Talk by a guy named Aaron Huey, A-A-R-O-N-H-U-E-Y. He goes to one of the poorer, he goes to one of the poorest. Good afternoon. We interrupt your class for two very important announcements. He talks about one of the poorest reservations. I'm very proud to announce the results Watch of the MIFA state championship. Our Divine Child Falcons won the 2015 Class B Forensic State Championship for the fourth consecutive year. Congratulations, Forensics Falcons. We soared to four. We qualified 24 entries and 38 Forensics Falcons in all 14 events. I was going to do Great Society. You'll have to watch the review session to see it. 24 entries advanced to the semifinals. And 14 events advanced to the semifinals.